The history of Rome was a long series of territorial conquests and domination of neighboring and conquered peoples. In its beginnings, Rome is just a small city which is under Greek and Etruscan influence. The history of ancient Rome is classically divided between a royal period at its beginnings, then the period of the Roman Republic, and then the era of the Empire from 27 before Christ to 476 after Christ. Welcome to the Borders and Globalization podcast. Welcome to our listeners. My name is Ben. I'm a researcher with the Borders and Globalization project. I'm speaking from the traditional territory of the Lake Wigan peoples in the Salish Sea region. Today, we are going to talk about Hadrian Wall, Frontiers of the Roman Empire and Border Studies with David J. Breeze, British archaeologist and scholar of Hadrian's Wall, the Antonin Wall, and the Roman Army. David has written a lot of books and articles about the frontiers of the Roman Empire and the Roman Wars. He was also chairman of the International Congress of Roman Frontier Studies from 2000 to 2015. Welcome on board, David. It's great to see you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for having me. My first question is very general, David. Can you give us a quick overview of the archaeological knowledge of the frontiers of the Roman Empire? What is the state of knowledge today? Ah, of the whole of the Roman Empire. <laughs> Well, um, the, the, the state of knowledge is very mixed. Um, I think that's the most important thing to say. So we, we have um, frontiers like um, Hadrian's Wall and the Antonine Wall and the German frontier, Austria, where, for me, modern research started in the 1890s. Um, 1890 on the Antonine Wall, 1892 Hadrian's Wall and the German Limes Commission was founded that year as well. Um, Elsewhere, um, a lot depended um, uh, in North Africa, for example, on, on uh, the French, um, who were the archaeologists who explored uh, the Roman remains in um, Algeria, Tunisia in particular. Um, still absolutely essential to our understanding of Roman frontiers there. The Italians, to an extent, and the French in, in Libya, and then, of course, when we get to um, the Middle East, it, it, it is a whole um, collection of individuals, French, Italian, um, and so on, archaeologists who went out so often in the, um, um, in, in the interwar years, 1920s, 1930s, and their work is still absolutely basic in, in North Africa, in, in the Middle East. Um, uh, and it's only intermittently that further work has been undertaken. And a lot depends on the safety of the country. <laughs> so Jordan, which is regarded as safe, has had a uh, lot of work by uh, uh, particular uh, Tom Parker, the late Tom Parker of, uh, from America. Um, and other countries, of course, um, you know, are now inaccessible, like Syria. Um, so... Uh, the, the the answer to the question is our knowledge is very mixed. Uh, and, in, of course, that's unfair on the countries where we haven't been able to do much recent work. Mm -hmm. um, because if you like uh, Hader's Wall with, uh, where are we now, two, two, 200 years of excavation. Actually, the earliest excavations were um, in, in the 1830s. Um, the knowledge has been built up, um, and if we're not careful, we assume that these European frontiers are the norm, and they're not. Um, each frontier has its own particular um, uh, a background uh, uh, of archaeological information, uh, and, and we should all re re respect that and uh, try to take into account when we are uh, dealing with different frontiers, uh, the traditions and cultural background of each country in the empire. Great. 
Thank you, David, for this rich histor historical and complex synthesis. <clears throat> Border studies always ask questions about the linear or zonal nature of borders and the function of separation and or their function of cooperation. Above the Roman Empire, we also know the expression imperium sine fine, an empire without end or limit. David, what have been the functions of the frontiers of the Roman Empire? Yes. Um... I'd like to start off in a sort of an oblique way. One of my professors at university said, Roman frontiers um, are an example of failure. Mm -hmm. It's the failure to deal with um, th that statement you've just given us, uh, to, to Rome has given you power without limit, without end. Um, and this, of course, didn't happen. Um, so frontiers are intimately related to how the Romans perceive themselves. Um, and in a way, of course, it's no different today. Um, but uh, for the Romans, um, they, 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 they saw themselves um, conquering their own world. Now, it's not as simple as that, of course. In North Africa, they realized pretty quickly um, that um, the Sahara was there and there was nothing in it for them. So the strip in North Africa is quite narrow and on the whole there wasn't much in the way of a linear barrier. The linear barriers we have seem to deal with more like transhumans than they do with um, controlling the movement of people in and out. And in the Middle East, um, uh, the, the situation again is different. I mean, here we also have a desert, of course, Syrian desert and Jordanian desert in the south, um, which is where the frontier actually follows the 250 millimeter isohyd. The frontier follows the line at which agriculture ends being possible. Mm. So they don't, they don't go further east because you can't grow stuff there. You can't grow material to crops to feed your animals as much as feed yourselves. Uh, and then in the north of um, these, the Middle East um, is Parthia and later Persia. So that, that, is, that is a boundary force on Rome. Europe, of course, um, is also remains complex. Um, we've got the great rivers, the Romans liked uh, uh, strong features. Mm -hmm. Tacitus comments on the rivers, Rhine, Danube, Euphrates. So um, the boundaries uh, relate often to, to, to rivers, uh, but they, um, they move a, uh, forward in Germany from the, the upper reaches of the Rhine and Danube, and they also, in, um, in, in the east, they take into account Dacia into the empire for a uh, 150 years, um, partly because of it was a very rich area, uh, Transylvania. But are these um, are these in Europe? I mean, we, the cr absolutely crucial thing is the frontier here is different. Um, Africa, the frontiers make themselves. Um, the Middle East, the frontiers make themselves. In Africa, the Romans tried. To go forward to the, they got it to the Elba, probably across it under Drusus, in um, in in the early years of the Common Era, uh, and then they stopped um, and and had to withdraw because of the Great Rebellion of AD nine, and it's only then, and over a hundred years, that we see the Romans slowly accepting that they weren't going to conquer the world tacitus a year after a uh, hundred years after the great stop the great moment to stop in germany says the conquest of germany is taking a long time <laughs> but at the same time the disposition of roman forces is demonstrating that it is actually 
come to a halt. Um, and we can we can see that first of all um, there was a great there was a strong build up of troops in what is now Germany and the Netherlands because they were expecting to move forward into Germany and then and um, in the eighties um, uh, the enemy becomes Dacia modern Transylvania in Romania so four legions are moved to the east. Um, and, and one of the problems when we're looking at frontiers and trying to work out what they're for and how they operate is um, you've got to think also of enormous numbers of men. I mean, a legion's 500 men. You've got to feed them. And the rivers become really important because they're great supply routes. So it, it's the situation, the, um, the answer is not just military. It relates to the supply of the army, uh, but even so, 500 men's lot. And you've got other smaller units in, in, in each province, so 500,000 each. So gradually what happens is the front, the, these units are spread along a line, the, the Danube, the Rhine um, in particular. Um, and we've got to ask ourselves, um, first of all, is this to do with... Um, uh, supply or is it to do with defending the empire and of course this is where linear barriers come in um to come straight back to your question these are really important because they absolutely shout at us these are defensive but your question is are uh, is that really true yeah um you know you couldn't stand on top of the german fence unless you were in the Roman Army Acrobatic Corps um, and throw spears, um, possibly not even on the top of Hadrian's Wall, uh, because we see the bottom part is very broad, but the top might not be. Um, and the Roman attitude is not to fight from behind walls, but as jo Robin Collingwood said 100 years ago, if Hadrian's Wall was attacked, they would open the gates um, and march out <laughs> into the field to fight. That's the Roman way of doing it. So we've got we've got to tease out why they bother to build these linear barriers. And it may well be nothing more to do with it's the best and easiest way to protect the empire from what happens on every frontier throughout the history of the empire, which is raiding. Okay. Okay. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Uh about the synthesis of the about the complex question of the functions of the frontiers of the Roman Empire. And we know the concept of Mare Nostrum, uh, the, the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, uh, around it, surrounded by the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. I have now a rather technical question, and you spoke about that. Uh, we often talk about the Roman limes. Mm. This term limes mm. uh, has had uh, several meanings, you know. Yes, uh, a road or the limit between two lands or a zone with a military and different purpose. It is not clear or is clear. But my question is this one: What does archaeological research reveal in terms of the empire's defensive systems? Yes, uh, Limes is a difficult word because it's got modern connotations. Our German colleagues use it um, very frequently. Um, the British tend not to. Uh, we would talk about the Congress of Roman Frontiers. Our German colleagues would talk about the Limes Congress. Um, and uh, Ben Isaac has discussed this in great detail, whether the, the word Limes starts out from throwing roads out into um uh from the from the frontier and it did it just become the word meaning um the frontier line as we can see it did somewhere around 400 um in in the late empire you know we we do have recorded the limes tripolitanus that sort of mm. thing which is clearly a a frontier but it's not a linear barrier because there is no linear barrier there and the Romans used different words for fort. I mean, you could have cast, 
Castra, Castellum, Presidium, just to give you three names for a four. And we're trying to make sense uh, of, of a, um, a, a language uh, which was complex. But, okay, try to come back to your uh, question. Um, the, one of the, the issues, again, I want to stick with sources, if I may. The, the Greek orator Aristides in the 140s gave a speech in Rome, and he talked about the empire uh, surrounding itself uh, with um, uh, uh, walls. And one of our problems when, when we, is most of the people who talk in these terms are Greek. Um, and, of course, Greek had given up mm -hmm. having an empire. It was all part of Rome. Um, so what did they really mean by this? I mean, it's like a Britain today sort of trying to produce uh, some term from the heyday of the British Empire and assuming it's still relevant today, which obviously it isn't. Um, and, and so we've got these phrases like, um, you know, is it Appian who says, well, you know, the, 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 Romans, the Romans control all the world, world that's worth having. Um, but is this real statement or is it just a justification mm -hmm. that they have stopped expanding? So we have a, you know, a, re a real problem. What, what, in trying to make sense of these statements from antiquity. What we can see, I think, clearly enough, is what the Romans are doing with their forts is to protect the, edge, the, uh, the, the empire by um, uh, having a military presence around the edge. But... Um, where are we? Uh, four years ago, I organized a session at a conference. Um, and we started out, the aim was a debate. And we started out with 21 reasons which had been given for the purpose of Roman frontiers. And we narrowed this down to eight. Good job. And um, so each speaker, Specialist in the area, the period had ten minutes to justify to his audience, and and unfortunately it was all men. His audience of the function, the one that won was it was to prevent raiding, but amongst others were frontier walls like Hadrian's Wall, uh, big forts like Bunjem in North Africa were big in order to impress. The people on the other side um, act as a symbol for Roman power and intimidate them into not attacking the Romans. Mm. And that so we've just got two examples there. One colleague talked about them really to do with defense. Um, others that they were a clear boundary to the edge of Rome. So I, I think your question is really difficult to answer. Of course. Um, we're still talking um, about trying to answer the question because it is obviously an important one. What was the... Um, uh, um, we're looking at the single largest surviving monument of the Roman era in its frontiers. It's not true to say we don't know what their purpose was, Excuse me, because one of the points we made at this conference four years ago that there was unlikely to be one reason for the building of a frontier. There was they were multi-purpose. They were there to intimidate. They were there to defend the empire. They were there to stop raiding. Um, uh, 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 and they were there to pr protect the locals in the area of the of, of the frontier. Um, as Eric Burley put it in 1956, uh, when the Western Europe was being protected by the American shield, um, possibly a you know comparable situation, um, he wrote a paper saying that Roman frontiers were there to uh, allow the peaceful economic development of the land behind. But all of these could operate together. Yeah. 
Yeah, very right. Very right, David. And thank you for this clear answer. <clears throat> now we can explore a little bit more the military dimension of the Roman Empire. And my question is this one. How was the Roman army organized on the frontiers of the empire? And finally, David, how did the Roman Empire see what was beyond its frontiers? Uh, sorry, uh, can you just re re repeat this, the second part? I missed. Yeah. How, how did it, about the army? How was the the Roman army organized on the frontiers of the empire? I know the legends have been moved in different pl places at different times, and finally. Uh, how did the Roman Empire see what was beyond its frontiers? Mm. Um, imperial powers have a really different attitude to the world than non-imperial powers. Yeah, <laughs> good. You're talking to me from Canada. <laughs> the, for the basics of the foreign policy of your country are very different from your southern neighbour yes. who feels itself capable of interfering in other countries if it so wishes. I mean, for a Britain under Margaret Thatcher, in spite of that special relationship, when Ronald Reagan invaded Grenada, he didn't bother to tell the British Prime Minister. That's how an imperial power works. Um, so. Um, when we're looking at uh, all of uh, the Roman world and what the Roman commanders thought and the Roman army thought, they didn't see the world as divided uh, between two sovereign states. No. They, they uh, were quite capable of interfering in the... Um, the the, the um, affairs of the uh, peoples, the, the states beyond them. Um, uh, we know that um, Antoninus Pius gave a king to the Quadi, who lived beyond the Danube. He gave a king to them. Um, it, it's just the extreme point of the Roman emperors wanting to make sure that the king um, of the state beyond them uh, was pro-Roman, so they were quite happy to interfere and get rid of the um, the, the um, of one king and replace him by another. Uh, in uh, the the other flashpoint, of course, is Armenia, where um, both Persia and before then Parthia and Rome felt that uh, they wanted to maintain that as neutral, if at all possible, and if not neutral, have a king who was on their side. Uh, and you see this in all the diplomacy which takes place under, say, Antoninus Pius, and kings coming to Rome, hostages in Rome. Um, I mean, the great series I, Claudius, which is, of course, based on uh, Suetonius's accounts of the emperors. But, you know, the, um, the king uh, Herod uh, uh, from Judea is being brought up in Rome. So they go back to govern their own countries as... Um, it, uh, uh, as friends of Rome. So uh, when we're looking at this, what we, we have a, is a boundary, and the Romans understood boundaries. They, you know, great mappers. Uh, they, uh, they, they understood where the empire stopped, uh, but they equally understood that they had the power to intervene beyond it. So... Um, this is this is what happened. Um, time, uh, we, we've got a, well, a a particular fourth century uh, commentary which I like very much. When the army uh, uh, had pursued uh, 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 a whole group of people who had attacked the Roman Empire, they pursued them into Germany, and they got to a place, and they knew what it was. It was a Roman fort that Trajan had built two hundred years before. I mean. This is amazing when you think about it. Yeah. Um, so you, they've got an enormous amount of knowledge as, as well to get them around. Uh, 
not always did it work in their favour. But so you, you've got this sovereign state who was prepared to intervene beyond, but it didn't necessarily have to be militarily. It could be by um, diplomacy, um, uh, as I, 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 I've described. And all of these as, aspects um, work together uh, to, 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 to create and support the Roman world view. Um, just as uh, they had what we would have called in the early empire client states, so they would have, um, uh, particularly on the eastern frontier, these Greek kings who, who were uh, were both supported by Rome and supported Rome. Yeah. Uh, insofar as you could see, when um, Trajan preparing in one one three to attack Parthia in the middle of modern Turkey, met the local kings. And wanted to know what troops they were going to provide for him. So you got a relationship which is very interesting both ways, and very interesting for a student of the British Empire, because when you look at, say, the United Arab Emirates or Qatar um, or, or the the Middle Eastern countries, they were never technically, on one level, part of the British Empire. They were protectorates. Yeah, and it's a very Roman way of um, controlling people on your boundaries or we, people you wanted to control. And, of course, I mean, depends what your boundaries are. Britain's empire was based upon communication with India, which is why the British Empire took on Aden and um, the um, the states around the, um, uh, around the Gulf. Um, that was very – but the, the attitude is very similar to Romans. I've wandered far from your question. <laughs> no, perfect, David. It's perfect. Uh, we we understood uh, that the the frontiers of the Roman Empire were built with a, a military dimension, but also with a strong diplomacy dimension. Uh, if if I could summarize uh, like that, yes. Uh, <clears throat> let's talk now about uh, the Emperor Hadrian. Hadrian mm. was born in seventy six, and he died in one hundred thirty eight. He succeeded Trajan in 117 and reigned until his death. We know that uh, Adrian visited almost the entire Roman Empire and also its borders. David, who was Hadrian and what changed with Adrian's rules in terms of the empire's frontier strategies? Yes, a very good question. Who was Hadrian? Hadrian, on one level, was a normal Roman aristocrat. He went through the um, career ser of an aristocrat serving in the army, um, command governing a province, forming a part of Tra Trajan, who was his cousin's um, entourage. Um, so... He had a lot of experience in the army. Um, and I think this is important for us to, re to remember because he had seen Trajan's wars in action in Dacia um, in the first years of the second century and again in the second decade <coughs> in Parthia. And it's interesting, you see, I mean, Trajan, yes, Trajan conquered Dacia, but it took him two goals. Yeah, I mean, he's he, he, an enormous army. Um, and the, the, Hadrian, I think we can assume, uh, taken the lesson from this, it can take a lot of effort to crack the nut. And in the East, it was even worse, of course, because other countries, other sort of, uh, not countries, but uh, provinces, rather, came into rebellion in North Africa and, and in the uh, what we call the Middle East, um, it, it, um, land of Israel and Jordan and that coastal area um, it, at the very end of Hadrian's reign. At the very end, I beg your pardon, of Trajan's reign. But so... We, um, Hadrian was a clearly intelligent man and an acute observer. The second point I think is really important. Trajan didn't explicitly 
choose, by which I mean announce him as his successor. So he he must have felt insecure. Mm -hmm. um, it, the best we can do is Trajan is supposed to have chosen him on his deathbed, but we only know that because Trajan's wife said that, and she liked Hadrian. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and we can see what insecure people in power can do. It, it's really interesting, this, in relationship to Hadrian's psyche, because at the very beginning of his reign, he chops off the head of four senators. And this messes up his relationship with the Senate right to the very end and beyond the end. Antoninus Pius had to work very hard to get the Senate to accept Hadrian um, uh, as a, as a god, uh, uh, give him appropriate rights at the very after his death. So I think those we have to take into account those two. The third absolutely crucial element about Hadrian, although um, he was born in Rome, he, he came from a family that had helped colonize Spain, but was born in Rome. Um, he, he was very uh, very much a Grecophile. He, he he liked Greek culture. He visited Athens. Uh, several times he was accepted into the religious community in Athens. Um, and coming back to the point I made earlier about the attitude of the Greek historians who um, had given up ideas of empire a couple of centuries before, um, I think this must have had an effect on, on, on Hadrian because he stopped expanding the empire um, so I think if we put all this together, uh, we're looking at a man who um, had seen there were perils in trying to expand the empire, um, that he was a um, little bit insecure of himself, uh, and uh, he, he reflected an attitude of mind which wasn't interested in expanding the empire. So you put all those two those together, and I think I think what is important that he I suspect he appreciated that there there were problems and keep expanding the empire. I mean, if you stand back and look at it, you could if you if you want to be a general like Trajan in the Roman manner, conquer more, expand the empire. You can't go south. Nothing in the Sahara, as we touched on earlier. In the east, you've got desert, and then you've got Parthia. He had a go at Parthia and basically lost. I mean, if you give it the territory up, you lose. Um, north, it took him two goes to take in Dacia, and that was surrounded by the, you know, the Carpathian Mountains. So you had a geographical limit there. But in Europe, where's your limit? I mean, Hadrian would have read... The, the problems that Augustus had um, throughout his reign in dealing with the Germans. And there's a lot of discussion um, of so, uh, wh why the Romans failed in Germany. And part of it is because they, they, the, the, there wasn't the socio-economic structure in, mm. in, in Germany or in Northern Britain to, to help the empire consolidate its, its hold. So, uh, again... Um, because Hadrian had trotted round the Roman Empire and read, he would see, by Joe, this is a really difficult problem uh, for me um, if I want to go into Germany. And we have to then to look at a, at, at a subject we'll come back to again, perhaps, the Antonine Wall, where Antonine is pious after Hadrian's death, comes along. He has no military experience. And the Roman Empire technically, I mean, we would say it's a military dictatorship. Claudius required a triumph. Suetonius is quite open. Claudius was pulled behind from a curtain. He had no military experience. He wasn't allowed it. He was regarded as the, the fool of the family. He needed military experience. He came to Britain to get it. And he was sensible. He didn't go into Germany because Britain's a finite area. Antoninus Pius, what does he do? He comes back to have a go in, in, in Britain. And he goes in for a limited conquest in a place where... Um, there were there couldn't be a great conflict of energy of enemies fighting him. It's a limited operation. 
Um, and I think if, if we take that into account and think of Hadrian, he's, he's taking this sensible way out. He's saying, right, these are the borders. Like every emperor, every king, every prime minister, every president, they can't control things from the grave. So, of course, Antoninus Pius comes along and abandons Hadrian's wall. But, that, but what he then does is build another wall. <laughs> Thank you, David. Yeah, exactly. I think you're completely right about who was Adrian and the big move, the big changing in the mind of this empire connected to the, these borders of this of this Roman Empire, which finally reaches is is li limits social or political limits. Yes, <clears throat> but I mean, what, what I find interesting is this um, idea, as you say, of uh, uh, um, uh, empire without end, imperium without end. Um, a, the, uh, the other year, I was in, uh, one of my fairly regular visits to Rome, and in a particular museum, and there I came across an altar. Uh, dedicated um, and relating to the Emperor Constantine, mm -hmm. who is 150 years after Hadrian, and it still calls him Propagator Imperii, expander of the Roman Empire. It, it's the mentality, it, it's in the mind. You know, the Western countries today still think they can, you know, in some ways almost rule the world, don't yeah. they? You know, there's that attitude is still takes a long time to die. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't talk to my father-in-law about the British Empire because for him, Britain was only great when it had an empire. For me, Britain is great when it doesn't have an empire. <laughs> yeah, it's true, it's true. Yeah, it's complex, huh? these different views. Yes, yeah. Um, and David, now let's talk about the, the, the famous monument, and you spoke a little bit about that, uh, this famous monument that bears the name of Hadrian. In 2022, Hadrian's Wall celebrated its, its 1,900 anniversary. What is the history of archaeological research on Hadrian's Wall and what were the functions of Hadrian's Wall, David? Yeah. yeah. Well, let's start off with you ask is the history of archaeological research. Um, it, it's worth acknowledging that knowledge of Hadrian's Wall wasn't ever lost. There's a wonderful little book by Bill Shannon, who looks at knowledge of Hadrian's Wall in the Middle Ages, right through from the very end uh, of the empire in the 5th century, um, and what ve the Venerable Bede, whose book uh, was completed in 731 AD, uh, he wrote, he understood quite a bit about the empire, that there were two frontiers, for example. Um, but um, the, this knowledge moved, uh, was there. Uh, the great impetus to research took place, the first great impetus, in the Renaissance, because the printing press was invented. So mm -hmm. books which had been in monastic libraries could be published. So there was a great outpouring of information. Um, and the classical sources were available for study. This didn't always help. Um, the um, Some people could very clearly see that um, it was Hadrian. This is in the 16th century. Hadrian had built Hadrian's Wall. It was there. They could read it. Uh, but the, the problem for the Brits, as Bill ha Shannon points out, the, the English, I beg your pardon, is that the two absolute first statements were made by a Scotsman, the um, old enemy of the English, that Hadrian built the wall, and the second was by an Italian. Oh, my God, he was a foreigner, and he was a Roman Catholic to boot, and this is a Protestant country. So he wasn't believed. I mean, um, so we had this information from the 16th century, about who built the wall, uh, but it, 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 it wasn't accepted uh, for another uh, 250 years, eight, 1840. So my next uh, big date is about, um, uh, well, 1599 will do, um, a man called uh, William Cam Camden, um, who endowed the professorship in Oxford, 
uh, in his day. And with Robert Cotton came to explore and write about the northern frontier. So at that time, we've got a clutch of uh, explorers, basically, who are writing, because this is real bandit country in the this time, uh, writing about Hades War. So we've got the start of descriptions. Uh, the next really big point, I think, is 1840. A man called John Hodgson, very clever, worked out that he actually really seriously chaps was Hadrian that built Hadrian's Wall. Um, and uh, we really, it, it still took 50 years for that to be accepted. They're still being argued about at the end of the century. But the other, the other date, and the, really the last date, is 1892, when what I think of as scientific archaeological research started. Not as we know it today, um, but since then, there has been a continuum. So for me in Britain, the, 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 my hero is John Pattison Gibson, who in 1892 dug a turret in Hades War. He then started collaborating with F.G. Simpson, who collaborated with Ian Richmond and Eric Burley. And Eric Burley was my professor. Okay. So there's a continuum there of excavation and survey and thinking and writing about Hades War. Uh, and of course, you know, hopefully we've got more uh, sophisticated and we've got better tools. They still don't in themselves define a definitive as um, definition of what the purpose of Hades War was. I mean, I, I'm perfectly clear in my own mind. Um, and I belong to one school, which uh, really started with R.G. Collingwood, who was professor at Oxford. 1921, he wrote a paper and said, Hagar's War was not defensive. Why? Because the Romans weren't equipped with defensive weapons. You had two spears. Once you throw new spears from the top of Hagar's Wall, you don't have any spears left. Although they were trained in bows and arrows, um, on the whole, the, not all units on the, in the army had them. Um, the the um, they didn't have enough men to man the whole line of Hades War. There weren't enough access points, and it was in any case completely against the Roman attitude of mind. Which, as I said earlier, if it was attacked, the army would open the gates and march out to defeat the enemy in the field. Uh, so um, that's one view. Um, it, it, it's been discussed and uh, since, uh, but Collingwood, I think, for me, really has the um, the the, uh, the edge there. The other view is that it was defensive in some way, um, and I I honestly find this very difficult to believe because it it comes down to how we see how the Roman army operated, and they were most successful in the field. They did get defeated, obviously all armies do, but they were very successful in the field. Um, so um, there is that's how how I personally see it. And a lot of my research is looking at the available evidence. Um, in 1969, on the then pilgrimage, pilgrimage of Hayden's Wall, one of my professors said, we every picture we see of Hayden's Wall has a parapet along the top. And it's so dishonored. Sorrell's very famous painting. Um, it, it, it's bizarre when you look at it. There's a soldier with a standard standing on the top of Hades. He, he would have a standard on the top, standing on the top of Hades wall. And they're not looking to the north. They're chatting to their mates in the, down below the wall in the, on the south. But um, once you start... What's in everybody's mind is they look at every reconstruction of Hades Wall and it's got a parapet. But when you start analysing the evidence, um, where are we? The, the known, Hades Wall nowhere stands more than, say, three metres high. So we don't know what the top was like. And that three metres that we have is where the wall's quite narrow. Um, just don't just over two metres wide. So, and, and if you start thinking about it, okay, okay, we, we'll put a parapet up there, but your wall's only seven foot six wide in modern uh, uh, measurements, and you've got to have a parapet at the front, 
But if you were 12 or 15 feet high above the ground, then you would want a parapet at the back, wouldn't you? If you were strolling along in the gloom and the snow and the blizzard and so on, you would want to be protected from not being blown off. So by the time you've taken off, um, you know, a, a, a foot or two on e each side, you really don't have enough space anyway to lean back with your spear and throw it. It's too narrow even for that. And if you're carrying a bulky shield around, you'd hardly get in and out of the doorway because it's so bulky. So I, I think there's a lot of new thought going on about the function of Hader's Wall. It's really important you've raised this because we, we are teasing away the evidence, but we all come back to our own prejudices. <laughs> My view of the Roman army won't put it on top of the wall, uh, patrolling it uh, for other people. Um, even if pushed, they will say, ah, well, yes, OK, um, it probably wasn't patrolled. But if push came to shove and the wall was attacked, soldiers will run up there to defend the frontier. And I'm just saying, no, go back to Collingwood. That's not how the Rome, my view of how the Roman army fought. So it's a really important question you ask, and it's a really exciting one, because it um, the whole business of how we understand these frontiers yeah. tells us a lot about how the empire uh, operated as well. Lines of command, um, who took the decisions. When you look at the building of Hadrian's Wall, which we've touched on, um, the way that it's built and the changes in particular that's made, and there are there's about two dozen changes during the building of the war, reflect on what the Roman army was seeking to achieve. And the fact that we have in the the, the main second phase, the forts abs actually placed astride the wall emphasizes for us an intention to involve themselves, either being defending themselves or attacking beyond the wall and not just from the wall itself. Mm -hmm.